Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Behind the Scenes Curator's Talk. My name is Kristen Hoskins, and I'm the curator of lectures, courses, and concerts. Today's lecture, Boston Arts and Crafts Jewelry, Frank Gardner Hale and His Circle, will be presented by not one, not two, but three curators, um, which I think might be a course first here at the museum. Um, so it'll be presented by Noni Gadsden, Catherine Lane Weems, Senior Curator of American Decorative Arts and Sculpture, Megan Melvin, Jean S. and Frederick A. Scharf, Curator of Design, Prints and Drawings. Sure. I, and Emily Storr. Is that better? Yes. Rita J. Kaplan and Susan B. Kaplan, Curator of Jewelry. Thank you so much for joining us here today, and I will first welcome up to the stage Noni Gadsden. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this morning. And thank you, Kristen, for uh, getting through all of us there. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to speak with you today about, um, along with my brilliant partners, Emily Storer and Megan Melvin, uh, about the book that we co-authored, Boston Arts and Crafts Jewelry, Frank Gardner Hale and His Circle. As Kristen mentioned, the book was published to accompany an exhibition that recently opened in the, Kapl in the MFA's Kaplan Foundation Gallery called Boston Made arts and crafts, jewelry, and metalwork. Boston Made is the first exhibition to focus exclusively on arts and crafts metalwork created right here in Boston between 1900 and 1930. It features 70 pieces of jewelry, fine metalwork, by which I mean made of silver and some pieces of copper, along with enamels and design drawings. These objects come from several generous private collectors as well as the MFA's own collection. In the exhibition, we chose to explore both jewelry and fine metalwork, such as silver and enamels, as the craftspeople who made each shared the same skills, and many craftspeople worked in both categories. During the course of the study, we identified some interesting differences between the styles of the jewelry versus the metalwork, um, even when they were made by the same craftsperson. However, for the publication that we are discussing today, we focus solely on the jewelry. We wanted to dive deep into the stories of the makers, the jewelry they created, as well as who purchased these jewels and how they wore them. We especially wanted to highlight the work of Frank Gardner Hale, one of the leading Boston jewelry makers whose design archive we, was acquired for the MFA in 2014. This archival treasure trove includes hundreds of working drawings and presentation drawings, as well as letters and lecture notes, and Hale's own photography of his jewelry. As Megan, Emily, and I explored the Hale archives, we realized how much more there was to learn about jewelry making in Boston in the first decades of the 20th century. We wanted to learn more about Hale and those working at the same time. We knew that women started making jewelry in this period, but we wanted to know why it happened at this time. What about the arts and crafts movement allowed this change? And why was Boston such a hub of this activity? These conversations sparked the study that resulted in this publication and the related exhibition. So today, we will each present part of that story. First, I will give you an introduction to the arts and crafts movement and how it manifested here in Boston, the role of Boston as a center of art and education that led to the rise of metalworking and jewelry making in particular. Then Megan will discuss the fabulous research she has done into the early years of Frank Gardner Hale and share his archive and how we use it. And finally, Emily will discuss the lives and work of several of Hale's contemporaries and how this jewelry relates to fashion of the day. And since my job is to give you the historical context, I don't have as many pretty pictures as my colleagues. But rest assured, they are coming. And in the meantime, I will try to give you a sneak peek at some of the works as we go. In 1916, American Magazine of Art featured an article on hand-wrought jewelry in America. The author, Emily Graves, wryly observed, curiously enough, it is in once Puritan Boston that there is now the largest number of artist jewelers. The term artist jeweler referred to independent craftspeople who worked alone or in small workshops to design and create unique personal endowments. These craftspeople st strove to distinguish their creations from the elaborate and often ostentatious Victorian and Edwardian styles that dominated the market. The jewelry in the Victorian and Edwardian styles, like those seen here on the screen from the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, 
They prioritized the intrinsic value of the gemstones, usually diamonds or pearls, over the design of the setting. The corsage brooch on the left, for example, is acclaimed because it contains 305 diamonds. One critic of the period charged that jeweler's work, quote, had lapsed into mere gem selling, as there was little opportunity for artistic skill or creativity in design. Artist jewelers wanted to bring back the attention to the design and the color of the jewelry rather than the cost of the stones. In 1916, Emily Graves seemed to think her readers would be surprised to hear that once Puritan Boston supported such a large community of these avant-garde artist jewelers. You too may be surprised to hear, learn this as Boston still retains the reputation of being liberal in politics but conservative in art and culture. But the stereotype is wrong today as it was 100 years ago. At the turn of the 20th century, Boston boasted a vibrant community of artists, craftspeople, scholars, critics, connoisseurs, and patrons, all united by the shared interest in art and design. They believed that art and beauty were key to building and maintaining a civilized and economically sound society. They built museums, such as the original MFA seen here in Copley Square, right here. They built architectural masterpieces, such as Henry Hobson Richardson's Trinity Church, fortunately still in Copley Square, and beautified the city with parks and green spaces, most notably, notably Frederick Law Olmsted's emerald necklace. They introduced art into the lives of all children with the 1970 Massachusetts Drawing Act that required public schools to provide instruction in mechanical drawing and developed manual training classes that taught students basic skills in woodworking, metalworking, and toolmaking that they believed could be applied across all trades, academic disciplines, and help in all aspects of life. They also established secondary schools focused on art, such as the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, and focused on art education as the Massachusetts Normal Art School, which is now Mass Art. It is no surprise then that Bostonians eagerly embraced the philosophy of the arts and crafts movement that had originated in England. The arts and crafts movement combined design reform and social reform in reaction to the dehumanizing effects of industrialization on everyday life. Arts and crafts leaders promoted artistic activity, appreciation of beauty, and making and using handcrafts as essential elements to leading a joyful and fulfilling life. They exalted the individual craftsperson, praised the dignity of physical labor, and urged followers to seek simplicity and respite in nature. Arts and crafts was not a specific style, an artistic style, but more a philosophy about a way of living in which art played an integral role. Non-artisans could participate by becoming consumers of handcrafted goods and artistic wares. As one of the movement's leaders, William Morris, famously said, have nothing in your houses that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. I can't say I live that way. <laughs> Especially with young children, it's plastic everywhere. But in short, the proponents of the arts and crafts movement believed that making art and incorporating beauty into daily life would bring happiness and contentment to all members of society, rich or poor. As these philosophies spread across the globe, different countries, regions, or even individuals developed their own specific arts and crafts styles that drew from their community's specific past and local environment. Each individual or group could also choose which of the arts and crafts concepts to follow or to emphasize. Therefore, arts and crafts philosophies inspired a wide range of artistic styles around the world, from historic revivals to strikingly modern-looking designs. Boston quickly became the intellectual hub of the arts and crafts movement in the United States and spread the philosophy through its well-established educational institutions and literary and publishing community. The city's cultural leaders organized an arts and crafts exhibition in 1897, held at Copley Square on Clarendon Street in the Back Bay, an image of which you see here. The tremendous success of the show in attracting attention and visitors led them to establish the Society of Arts and Crafts to support and connect craftspeople and patrons 
in what they called mutually helpful relations. From the start, the Society of Arts and Crafts founders saw their organization as a leader of the arts and crafts enthusiasts throughout the United States, using the Boston crafts community as its testing ground. But these intellectuals soon realized that Boston had more thinkers than doers. Demin Waldo Ross, an artist, collector, teacher of design theory, and founding member of the Society of Arts and Crafts, as well as trustee of the MFA, he grumbled about this lack of production in an essay he published in 1903. What is the matter with the arts and crafts? Why is it that, in spite of widespread interest, with much talk and much activity, so little very good and satisfactory work is produced? One of the answers to Ross's question is that although Boston was teaching arts and crafts ideas, there were still limited opportunities to learn both the principles of design and the technical skills of craft. On one hand, design was being taught by the city's schools, uh, the art schools, but not the technical craft skills. On the other hand, craftsmen learned skills in the, on the job in factories, but they were often taught only specifics to their role, not a well-rounded education, including elements of design. The traditional apprenticeship model was increasingly rare and considered old-fashioned as it required a multi-year commitment on, part, on the part of both the student and the master. So Bostonians, particularly those associated with the Society of Arts and Crafts, sent about to establish opportunities for aspiring independent craftspeople to learn technical skills by incorporating craft classes in the art schools, and while also offering design classes for craftspeople. And for primarily logistical reasons, most of the first craft, craft programs to be incorporated in local art school was metalworking, since metalworking required less capital investment in equipment and space. In 1901, Lauren Hovey Martin was the first teacher of the arts and crafts to be hired by the Massachusetts Normal Art School. He taught copper and silver and worked in a small attic space that was set out for him right up in here on the corner of Exeter and Newberry Streets. The program grew quickly and grew in popularity as students were able to learn both the design principles at the school as well as some of these craft skills from Martin. Lauren Hovey Martin himself was perhaps the most important metal worker in Boston that so few people have heard of. He was born and raised in Lowell, Massachusetts, and was believed to have studied art and design at the Cowles Art School in Boston before going to England for two years to learn metalworking. He went to the Birmingham School of Art, uh, and then he worked with the master enameler uh, Alexander Fisher in London. He brought these new skills back to Boston in late 1899 or early 1900, just as the arts and crafts movement was gaining attention in Boston. Around that time, he made this covered taza in copper, which had stayed in his family until it was given to the MFA in 1997. He made it out of copper because he didn't have the money to make it out of silver, and he wanted to show off his skills. And copper is as easily worked as silver, so this wonderful piece is in, now in our collection. Martin, with his, these skills, was a rarity. So he also taught at the Rhode Island School of Design, the Brookline High School, and summers at the Birdcliff Artist Colony in Woodstock, New York, and other locales. Martin also served on the jury for the Society of Arts and Crafts, which was a very influential position, judging the work of all people who wanted to be members or to sell, and the, then who's those who wanted to sell their wear, wares in the society shop. In 1907, Lauren Martin was called the finest metal worker in the United States. Today, he is best known, if he is known at all, for his work in enamels, such as the gorgeous copper box with an enamel plaque featuring a phoenix on the lid. The, his use of metal foil underneath the, the glass enamel that gives this sparkle and iridescence to the piece is one of his uh, signature uh, ideas. He also outlines and pricks of gold to heighten the shimmering effect. He experimented with many techniques and materials. Uh, and while, night, while enameling was a Renaissance era sort of skill um, Mart that was revived by Martin's mentor, Alexander Fisher in England, 
Martin was the one who brought it to the United States. He was the leading proponent and practitioner of enameling during the first decades of the 20th century. But there are several reasons why Martin is not better known today. One, he didn't sign most of his work. Another is that he focused on teaching. He taught at the Massachusetts Normal School for 37 years and taught scores of students who went on to become big names in metalworking and enameling. And he also spread uh, the art of enameling through his students as well as through books that he published on the, the topic. In 2005, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts also started a metalsmithing class under the tutelage of Society Arts and Crafts member George J. Hunt, who, made the, uh, who you can see standing here in a later picture. Hunt was born in Liverpool, England, and served a seven-year apprenticeship on silver, uh, in silversmithing before immigrating to the United States in 1885. He worked in several large commercial firms, but was as unsatisfied by this work, so he returned to Liverpool to run a cooperative arts and crafts workshop in 1905, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts recruited him back to Boston to establish classes in metalworking and jewelry making, which he did for several decades. Like Martin and, and scores of, uh, like Martin, he taught scores of students, and some of them, such as Dedham native Catherine Pratt, who made the magnificent Gothic style box on the screen, went on to successful careers in silversmithing and jewelry making. Pratt represents another important aspect of Boston arts and crafts, jewelry, and metalwork, the new opportunities in the field that arose that opened up for women. Prior to the advent of the arts and crafts movement, few, if any, women worked in metals. It was deemed too physically demanding or too dirty for the feminine type. In addition, the only way to learn the skills required was through apprenticeship or factory work, both unsuitable for women. One female jewelry maker noted in 1907, however, that jewelry, maker in, jewelry making in particular offers a remunerative field in the larger cities to women with good taste and deft fingers. I recommend jewelry making is especially suited to women not only because it is dainty work, requiring skill rather than strength, but because it can be done in the home. Even more importantly, the educational opportunities in school settings, such as at the Massachusetts Normal School and the School of the Museum of Art, where women could go to get this training, allowed for a huge democratization of the field. Elizabeth Copeland is a great example. She was born in Revere, Massachusetts, and then her family moved to Bedford, Mass, when her father became a farmer. She worked on the farm throughout her childhood while attending school and well into her adult life. She later confessed that she had little direction in life until she enrolled in a design course taught by Miss Amy Sacker at the Coles Art, Cowles Art School in Boston in 1896. While there, she discovered metalworking and enameling, which she studied with Lauren Martin. She later claimed to have been drawn to enameling and metalworking due to her intense love of color and the challenge of working in a male-dominated field. Copeland joined the Society of Arts and Crafts in 1900 and started exhibiting her work locally and nationally. By 1903, she was getting national recognition in magazines, which claimed that she had developed, quote, a style quite her own. The box on the previous slide and this candlestick show Copeland's signature style. Medieval-inspired forms with thick cloisonne wires outlining the decoration and creating cells, which she filled with enamel. Unlike most cloisonne, however, Copeland did not fill all of the cells, using the unfilled cells as part of her design and drawing attention to the process of making the piece. We know from period articles and catalogs that Copeland made jewelry as well, and you will hear about the rest of her story and some of her jewelry from Emily later on. In addition to metalworking classes incorporated at the art schools, the other Society of Arts and Crafts members established courses to teach craftspeople who had the technical skills but little knowledge of design theory. Our good friend, Dermin Waldo Ross, who had taught a course called The Principles of Pure Design at Harvard since 1892, started teaching a summer course in 1899 for art educators, design instructors, artists, artisans, and amateurs. 
His lectures emphasized harmony, balance, and rhythm. Similarly, Arthur Wesley Dow, a society member, artist, and educator who had earned a national reputation in 1899 with his publication, Composition, which gave instruction on how to teach art and design, Dow started a summer school in his native Ipswich, Massachusetts, that attracted many artisans. And Amy Sacker, a book designer, illustrator, and painter, taught a course on decorative design at the Cowles Art School in Boston's Back Bay starting in 1894. After Cowles closed in 1900, Sacker started the Sacker School of Design, which offered instruction in bookbinding, interior decoration, and design in a range of media, including metals, wood, and textile. All of these instructors were members of the Society of Arts and Crafts, as were many of their students. In my research, I have learned that many of the early initiatives of the Society of Arts and Crafts and its members focused on metalwork and jewelry, and that in its formative years, the Society did more to foster the development of artistic jewelry making in Boston than any other craft. Perhaps the Society's most important initiative was the creation of a sales room and exhibition space for members to show and sell their wares. This went a long way in fulfilling the Society's mission of developing mutually helpful relations, bringing craftspeople and patrons together. The shop was located in the Society's headquarters, first at 1 Somerset Street on Beacon Hill, and then at number 9 Park Street, an address which many of you may be familiar with. <laughs> to maintain the Society's goal of promoting higher artistic standards in the arts, all work displayed and sold in the shop was vetted by a jury. The society jury was composed of knowledgeable society members, including craftsmen, architects, instructors, and patrons. Through its strict standards and prolific criticism, the jury became a dominant force in shaping the look of the arts and crafts movement in Boston and further afield. One of the society's first special, uh, first special exhibitions that focused on a specific craft was an exhibition featuring jewelry and enamels in December 1905. Jewelry and enamel exhibitions were then held regularly twice a year after that. How I wish we had pictures of those exhibitions. However, 1905 was also the first year that the jury started publishing their commentary in hopes of instructing and influencing a broader segment of the membership. The leader of the jury was an architect, design professor, and art critic, C. Howard Walker, you see here. Walker had led the society's jury from its establishment in 1901, and he did not hold back on his critiques. In 1905, those comments published in the annual report were particularly harsh on jewelry. He noted, perfectly indiscriminate association and treatment of both metals and stones appears in the jewelry contributed. Silver surrounds odds and ends, scraps of stone with have no intrinsic value, and copper surrounds opals. And as to relative workmanship, too often some of the civil work could be better done in iron. All desire for or knowledge of surface treatment in the metals seems to have expired. They are simply jigsawed discs into which a stone is planted. And the chains are in most cases puerile to the last degree. The report for the next year, 1906, was no better. Very little improvement in jewelry during the year, most of it thoroughly crude and childish in idea. Perhaps the jury, with Walker leading the charge, felt that tough love was the right approach. However, not everybody was so critical. An article in 1906 Good Housekeeping magazine, which was titled Specimens of Craftsman Jewelry, highlighted the work of Boston artist jewelers, most of whom she, the author believed represented workers skilled in the technique of craft and keenly alive to the imaginative possibilities of jewelry and its place among the artistic crafts. One year later, in December 1907, the jewelry and enamel exhibition at the Society of Arts and Crafts included nearly all of the important American art jewelry makers of the day, including work by Jane Carson of Cleveland and Margaret Rogers of Boston, whom you will learn more about from Emily later. The exhibition was called by a reviewer from the Boston Transcript, the most important showing of jewelry that has been brought together since the arts and crafts movement was launched in this country. Another critic proclaimed the exhibition was a distinct raising of the standard in jewelry and has been noted in this exhibition, 
a betterment altogether in the direction of delicacy, refinement, and to a considerable extent, distinction. The critic attributed the significant change in the makers to their heeding the previous criticisms suggested by the jury. However, there is one other major difference in the December 1907 exhibition, and that is the arrival of Frank Gardner Hale. Hale's debut in the society's showrooms garnered much attention. Quote, the clue or the great point of interest of the whole exhibition unquestionably was a large collection of objects from the Copley Square studio of Frank Gardner Hale. They reveal in Mr. Hale a craftsman with, a gr with an interest in very definite symmetrical design which he executes with patience and enthusiasm. It was also noted that, quote, those qualities of good drawing and good workmanship, which the admission jury of the Society of Arts and Crafts has been preaching for many years, seem to be preeminent in his chains and pendants. Clearly, the work of Frank Gardner Hale had made an impact. And now we'll learn more about this important artist jeweler from my colleague, Megan Melvin. Thank you so much, Noni. So now that we have a broader picture of the arts and crafts community developing in Boston at the turn of the century, I'm going to focus on a specific artist, the jeweler and enamelist Frank Gardner Hale, and how he emerged as a major force among Boston's artist jewelers. And so as mentioned, the MFA acquired Frank Gardner Hale's design archive in 2014. And now four years later, it's sort of fun for me to remember that at the time of the acquisition of the archive, my familiarity with Hale as an artist didn't extend far beyond my knowledge of this brooch you see on the, this exquisite colorful brooch you see on the left along with some other, a handful of other pieces. But when the opportunity to acquire his archive arose, uh, Hale's documented significance as an arts and crafts jewelry maker of Boston, it quickly garnered the support of many colleagues and key donors who made this acquisition possible. When we acquired the archive, it didn't really look anything like this. This is what, what it looks like today if you want to come and make an appointment uh, to look at some of the drawings. Uh, the whole archive consists of hundreds upon hundreds of pieces of paper uh, came to us in a large Rubbermaid bin, and it took us well over a year just to get it in a state like this so that we could begin to conduct research in a more focused way and begin to understand Hale as a jeweler. I want to give you just a little overview of the type of material that's in the archive and how it launched the conversations that led both to the book and the exhibition. The archive contains several scrapbooks, such as this one. In fact, if you go to the exhibition, you're going to see this exact uh, double-page spread. And if you're really keen and love the drawings, come back at least twice during the course of the 16-month run, because every six months we're going to uh, swap it out for a different uh, double-page spread because the works are so light-sensitive. And as beautiful as the scrapbooks are, but the archive also contains hundreds of photographs, uh, many of them loose and with annotations that are proving to be very helpful to us or pasted into scrapbooks. Some of the drawings relate directly to uh, the photographs. Here I'm showing you sort of loosely related items. Uh, but again, I want to emphasize the importance of the large quantities of photographs in the archive because they show pieces that were actually made, which is critical uh, to expanding our understanding of Hale's productivity. Our initial reviews of the material made it clear that there was a great deal more to learn about Hale and that his production was much higher than the number of pieces known to us today. And also included in the archives are copies of annotated lectures, articles, reviews, and other ephemera. But the majority of the material is visual, like this. And so with this material on hand, my colleagues and I, we embarked on preliminary research. And because in addition to this paper treasure trove, we are also fortunate here in Boston to have uh, access to a number of scholars and collectors in, this, in the vicinity. And so we began mentioning our project to them. And this is when we had the first of many different strokes of luck. 
uh, we mentioned to Marilee Meyer, a local scholar, that we had acquired the archive and were beginning deeper research. And she made this uh, sort of remarks that she said she remembered having seen Hale's diaries when conducting research in Marblehead some time ago. Now, I was particularly intrigued by Marilee's crystal clear memory of specific diary passages that included mention of uh, Mrs. Ashby, the wife of Charles Robert Ashby, the leading arts and crafts architect, and designer, and social reformer, uh, that she had been playing the piano wearing a green gown. So since the MFA owned this major archive, I had to follow up on this lead. And so began um, truly a dogged search for these diaries um, over several visits to multiple historic associations or organizations in Marblehead. And my initial searches didn't turn anything up, so I called Marilee in again. And much to our delight, we found them at the Marblehead Arts Association. This is truly our eureka moment on a very hot summer's day after we'd gone through every closet in the Hooper Mansion. And of course, we found them in almost the very last box in the very last closet we opened. Um, and our shrieks of delight ricocheted through the building. Um, and so what we found, what you see there on the left, are his diaries from 1906, 1907, which cover his Hale's year of study in England and his European travels, as well as two later travel diaries from 1913 and 1933. And again, just to give you an idea of what they look like, uh, this is one random sample. And, at the top, uh, we had these notes. So this is when Hale has arrived at uh, Charles Robert Ashby's Guild of Handicraft. At the upper left, you can see it says, it was an ordeal being sized up by the English workmen. Um, and these diaries are fascinating. They include, there it's a day-by-day -day description of his, his training in England and all the key figures that he encountered. Along with the diaries, um, at the Marblehead Arts Association, we also found a few additional scrapbooks uh, which, uh, with information that supported some of our initial theories and ideas about Hale. Uh, from, from some contemporary articles and reviews, we knew that Hale was a graphic designer who had a very strong personal sense of independent artistic identity. And the material that we found proved this case to us. And so what you see here are some of his very early designs for book plates, probably even made when he was a student. Um, and other graphic elements that reveal, um, he, so he includes his initials even in the most mundane of decorative elements, sort of a way of leaving his mark even in graphic design. Okay. See, I'll just point this out here. Do you see here there's an F and here's an H. So he snuck it in. This would probably have just been filling space in an illustrated magazine or something. And it's too tiny to see here, but under here it says hail. And here he's playing with his initials, making an F and an H together. And so the abundance of documentation we had between the archive and what we found at the Marblehead Arts Association was overwhelming and inspiring in equal measure and really set us on the path to our, our projects. And the minute we began delving into the history of this artistic jewelry community and we realized how closely everyone worked and communicated, we realized it had to be a broader story. One question I kept coming back to was how did Hale go from being a graphic designer, so on the left you see an example of one of his sheet music covers, to a master jeweler, particularly at a time, as Noni explained, when the Society of Arts and Crafts, Boston, was in its relative infancy and there were you know, relatively few opportunities for formal metalwork training in Boston, particularly with regard to jewelry. The diary certainly proved helpful in understanding how his training helped him, not only with his technical skills, but really shaped him on every level, creating a foundation that supported him for the rest of his career. Originally from Norwich, Connecticut, uh, where Hale had studied at the new Norwich Art School, he came to Boston and was a student at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts for one year, where he enrolled in the decorations program, essentially a type of sort of graphic design program. He then worked for about a decade as a decade uh, as a graphic designer, and during that time, really, he was primarily a sheet music cover designer. And you can, if you're interested in those, you can go up to our Arts and Crafts Gallery on the second floor of the Art of the Americas wing to see some of those examples. Um, but he then he said he went to Europe to study metalworking because there were no programs available to him. 
it's not entirely true, but true that he didn't really have access to formal programs at the schools. And so Hale sailed to London in the spring of 1906, where he spent a first spent a few uh, weeks sightseeing and included seeking out very specific historic sites and paintings of significance to him, such as um, Andrea del Sarto's portrait of a young sculptor at the National Gallery. He was clearly interested and knowledgeable in all periods of art. Hale's diaries makes evident that he had a particular fondness for Renaissance art, and you can see that in some of his jewelry. And while in London, he made preparations for his residency at Ashby's Guild of Handicraft, which included buying film at the Kodak shop. It's through his diaries that we know that he had arrived in Europe an able photographer, and this was a skill that was to stand him in good stead in launching his career a year later. Hale then traveled to Chipping Camden, outside of London, to take up a prearranged residency to, studle, to study metalwork and enameling at the Guild of Handicraft, the community established by architect and social reformer Charles Robert Ashby, the elite, really great leader in England's arts and crafts community. What I'm showing you here is an exceptionally rare view of the metalwork shop at the Guild, possibly one of the only known images to exist, taken just a few months before Hale arrived. It was in fact taken by um, another New England artisan, H. Stuart Mickey, who went on to become the principal of the School of the Worcester Art Museum. And so you can see the space in which Hale would have worked. And also want to point out that you see men and women working in this space. So um, again, quite avant-garde for the time. Hale started off um, his training by raising hammered bowls, but soon moved on to other types of objects. I have no doubt that he made the spoon that I'm showing you on the right. It's a direct match for the types of spoons made at the Guild. He would have also seen covered bowls, uh, such as the one on the left with its jewel-like finial hovering above a pool of enamel. So this piece is so very typical of the work at the Guild, summarizes Hale's exposure to various metalworking and enameling techniques. By the end of his stay, which was sort of about three to four months, he was sufficiently proficient in metalworking that the guild bought some of his metalwork for retail in their own shop. During his time at the guild, um, Hale developed a passion for enameling, and his enthusiasm for the medium really radiates off the pages of his diary. And while Hale didn't make any jewelry at the guild, there is no doubt that Ashby and his colleagues left a lasting impression on him. Here I'm showing you one of Hale's designs for a peacock brooch that probably dates from about 1915, almost nine years after his study with Ashby. And here you see one of Ashby's most famous pieces of jewelry that he thought to have been made for his wife, Janet. You know, perhaps Hale saw it in person, pinned to that green gown she was wearing, playing the spinet. But even if Hale didn't see this piece in person, it was widely reproduced in contemporary periodicals. The source of inspiration for Hale is so clear, but he also makes the design his own, transforming it into a glittering ornament with enamel and carefully selected stones. You can see a version of this peacock pendant in the exhibition, and it, it certainly merits um, close looking. Throughout his stay um, at the Guild, you know, between working, Hale traveled all over England, again, seeking out major historic sites, even going to Oxford to see a, a cycle of stained glass windows by Burne Jones and William Morris at Manchester College. So he, again, was aware, really aware of what's going on in the arts and crafts movement in England. After his stint at the Guild of Handicraft ended, Hale set off on a European vacation with a friend from Boston, the composer Carl Manny, who was also the editor for one of the uh, sheet music companies that Hale worked for. Uh, they traveled all over. They traveled to the Netherlands, to Germany, Switzerland, and France. Uh, at one point, staying you know, in a hotel, um, an, Art Nouveau an Art Nouveau hotel of the maddest kind. Um, so really wild, sort of that wild whiplash style. And again, taking in the sights, both old and new. And again, just to give you an idea of the artwork that Hale was seeking out, when he was in Paris, his last stop on his vacation, he made a point of going to the Pantheon to see Pierre Puvis de Chavannes' frescoes of the life of Saint Genevieve. 
And there's, again, no doubt that Hale was familiar with Puvi de Chavan because the murals at the Boston Public Library were installed the year he came to a study at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, and it would have been quite a big event um, in his life. Um, but the, although he had this wonderful vacation, the primary aim uh, of his travels to the continent was to secure an apprenticeship of sorts with a jeweler, either in Switzerland and France. And so wherever he went, you know, he was just visiting jewelers, um, and, but sadly to no avail. He tried his hardest. Even on his very last day in Paris, he was going around to jewelers, um, but was unsuccessful, so he returned to London and tapped into his network of contacts. Uh, there was an SMFA alum, uh, Will Hadaway, who was there, and he also connected with some of the artists he had become friendly with at the Guild. And thanks to these, he was introduced to the English jeweler, Fred Partridge and Fred Partridge's wife and fellow artist, May Partridge, who agreed to take him on for an apprenticeship of sorts. And with this piece, as you can see, Hale was exposed to a very high level of um, sophisticated craftsmanship, as seen in this exquisite necklace uh, that depicts four butterflies facing one another. I'll just point these out. You see here, there's the body of the butterflies and their wings above, so they're their heads are facing each other. Um, Hale was nowhere near the level of skill at this point, but during his time with the Partridges, he was exposed to every aspect um, of what was necessary to set up as an independent jeweler. That could be setting up his bench, um, where to procure materials, and he certainly learned a wide range of techniques, either from the Partridges but he also took classes in London and visited multiple displays of contemporary art and craft. His diaries make clear that he worked very, very hard um, making jewelry, visiting the South Kensington Museum, or now the Victoria and Albert Museum, to sketch jewelry. Uh, but he did take a break over Christmas to travel up to Glasgow with his friend from the Guild, Alec Miller. Even in three days, he managed to pack a lot in. He made a point of seeing portraits by Whistler and he also uh, managed a quick visit to the avant-garde um, tea rooms designed by Charles Remini Mackintosh for Miss Cranston. Um, he probably didn't go into this exact room because this is the ladies' dining room, but again, I want to show you the, the color scheme of the type of spaces he was exposed to. This is, again, a very, very um, avant-garde space uh, with the color schemes of purple and pinks against, uh, against white. And I also wanted just to show you, again, a little detail from the space of the, t the tea rooms. Um, here you can see the sort of the similarities between the incorporation of moonstones. Moonstones and moonstone-like ornament were very popular um, with artists in England and the United States. And so their smooth, rounded surface and subtle coloration were a very popular choice for arts and crafts jeweler sort of a direct counterpoint to those faceted diamonds mentioned by Noni. So after an intense period of study with um, Fred Partridge, again, so four, four to six months, Hale returned to Boston in the spring of 1907 and set up a shop not far from here at 400 Northampton Street um, in the same building as Lauren Hovey Martin, the enamel artist mentioned by Noni. And as, as we've mentioned, he was exhibiting large numbers of uh, pieces of jewelry by the end of the year in Boston, in Providence, um, and likely elsewhere too. And the other remarkable factor is that he appears to have been nominated a master craftsman of the Society of Arts and Crafts, a really significant accolade almost immediately upon his return to Boston. So typically you enter the society as a craftsman and you know, depending on your skill and productivity, were nominated for elevation to master a few years later. And Hale seems to have been um, one of the exceptions. You know, clearly his training with leading figures in England carried tremendous weight. So what did his work look like? Uh, it can be quite difficult to date Hale's jewelry as well as um, that of his counterparts because by and large, the look of his jewelry 
with some exceptions that are related to trends in fashion that Emily will cover shortly, that didn't change. And so this is where the Hale Archive is proving to be very helpful. We know that Hale was at his first address, the Northampton Street one, for about five years. He moved to number two park in 1913 and remained there for the rest of his career. So with the image I'm showing you here, we're confident that this was made during the first six years of his career because it's signed and dated uh, for his first address. And it's also, I want you to know, it says designed and executed by Frank Gardner Hale. Again, he's emphasizing that he designed it and he made it. He had, uh, over the course of his career, had apprentices uh, working with him, but in this case, he's making the distinction that it, he was the person behind it. The it also, as you can see, it's a little hard to read with the writing, but he lists all the materials, um, which is extremely helpful with black and white photography because, of course, we can't tell um, which stones are incorporated in uh, his design. And as you saw from that first, his early business card, um, Hale described himself as a maker of jewelry and enamels right from the very beginning. And Hale's enamels certainly represent um, an aspect of his career that is less well remembered uh, today than it should be. And I'm not going to spend um, much time on it today, but again, wanting to emphasize that he not only just incorporated enamel into his jewelry, but also created pictorial plaques, such as this fish panel on the left, considered to be one of his finest works. Hale was clearly very proud of, of who he was and what he had achieved prior to becoming a jeweler. Here we have a, a view of his studio uh, from the early years of his career. So this is a clearly a very carefully staged photograph of his workspace and shop, and there he is on the left um, at his workbench. But it has been possible for you to work out in certain instances what is on the wall. And so what he has hanging on the wall are examples of his graphic design from his, the previous 10 years. So just here, just two examples I've been able to, to spot um, for you. So designing textbooks or children's book covers. So again, this is how Hale is choosing to present himself. He's not um, starting afresh. He's building on you know, a decade plus of artistic training and he's very proud of it. The archive contains uh, numerous pencil sketches. Some of them are dated like the one on the left. Um, again, but relatively few are dated, but again, this is quite helpful to us to at least begin to create some order or chronology for his stylistic development. Um, the image on the left includes little letters that say, so you can see E or P, like the indication of a stone, and very specific here he's saying five topaz. So these are maybe production drawings for either himself or an aide memoir or um, instructions for the apprentices, apprentices in his shop. And on the right, you have notes probably from uh, meetings with clients. Here we have lunch when finished. Here they're talking about what they want where, preferences for ring sizing. So he was on the road quite a lot and making notes and talking to clients and getting things just right. We've also learned that um, he appears to have done a lot of his design drawings for clients on his letterhead. So here I'm showing you an image from the scrapbook and then that I believe was in fact assembled at the end of his life or after his death by his wife who sadly cut up a lot of the correspondence um, and jo chose just to highlight the drawings. But here you can see he's made a note, please return drawing. Um, so very clever, he's sending you the letterhead. You're never going to forget that this is a design drawing from Frank Gardner Hale because he put it on his own letterhead. And here you can kind of see notes. He seemed to have written letters next to the drawings. Um, When he would be communicating with you as a client, he would um, be giving, for instance, be giving you options. So can you see here it says number one, number two, or number three. In, the, in number one and number two, he's probably working with existing stones. Maybe the client brought them to him. But here he's giving the option of adding four stones. And then here too, again showing you number one, number two, or at the bottom, here it's quite evident how just with a rearrangement of existing stones, you could achieve different designs. He was also quite, certainly quite frugal um, in 
with the, reusing the letterhead for his sketches. And here I'm just showing you some examples to show you the range of his work. Our exhibition includes some of his most um, impressive designs, but I also want you to understand that he created more modest pieces for his clients, you know, something a small pendant, such as the one you see here. And I'd also just love to draw your attention to this pendant um, with pearl and stones. This pendant is included in our exhibition, so perhaps you will seek it out. He also appeared to have designed um, and made many rings. Again, many of those are not known to us today. Perhaps his mark has worn off, so there are designs, or rings out there that we just haven't identified yet. Um, but hopefully the archive will help us um, make those re-identifications. And it's also evident that many of the Boston artists were working in a similar style um, so similar, in fact, that at a distance it can be really hard to know who made uh, which piece. Um, and this selection of crosses uh, makes this clear. So showing you designs by, pendant, uh, by Hale on the left, then one by Josephine Hartwell Shaw, and then Edward Oakes. And what's interesting is that Oakes trained and worked both with Hale and with Shaw. So who knows, maybe it's possible that he had a hand in, in all of these designs. One of the joys of the archive has been making direct matches, um, such as is the case with this wonderful opal necklace. And this is where the differences between the drawings and the final piece of jewelry tell us about some of the challenges and subtleties of production, because the end result is never exactly like the drawing as you see here. And uh, communicating these inevitable differences with his clients we made a challenge throughout Hale's career, as we learned from his lecture notes uh, from the 1920s and 30s. He wrote that the craftsman often meets a client who has so little knowledge of the possibilities and limitations of metals that he sometimes has to steer them away from demanding the impossible, and many cannot seem to understand a drawing. Um, and so again, you'll see here, you'll see slight differences in, in color and form and shape that just happens um, on the bench. And sometimes I think the end result is a, even an improvement on the original drawing. So you see here in the necklace, he's chosen to use stones of two different colors. And I think it enlivens the design in um, an improved way. And again, as beautiful as the drawings are, the photographs are also so very important, again, because they prove to us that certain pieces of jewelry were made. Again, you can have you know, hundreds of these beautiful drawings, but don't really know if these pieces were ever went into production. Um, and at the time, these were a really vital marketing tool, and Hale certainly understood the need to promote his work in every way possible. And I like to joke that were he working today, he would have had a really comprehensive website and would have been really active on social media. Um, and so as I mentioned earlier, dating his jewelry can be really difficult, so um, these photographs have been very helpful, and when we're able to find them in print, we're able to get more information about their date of execution, which is why we know that these photographs in the archive date to 1907, because that's when they were published. And he was so detail-oriented, I think it would have driven him crazy, I don't know if you can tell, but this was published upside down, and I think it would have been <laughs> very upset to have a pendant published upside down. Um, so he had... Um, the only other... Yeah, let me just skip over, I want to show you this example to also um, photographs from the, the scrapbook is, and just to give you an idea of how detail-oriented Hale was, I want to draw your attention to this enamel um, buckle here. And my colleagues and I have looked at this quite closely, including conservators, and we're not sure if it's a photograph of a drawing or a photograph of a buckle that is hand-tinted. But I'll show you here. Can you see these two little pins here? So what he either did was either pinned up the buckle or he pinned up a drawing of a buckle, took a photograph of it, printed it, and then tinted it by hand afterwards. Again, so this is just one, one example is giving us insight into the, his meticulous 
nature, and it's really interesting to speculate as to why he would go to such lengths. One of them could be, for instance, when he's promoting his material, he's sending out these tinted images to um, the individuals writing the reviews. He also, um, generally speaking, he excelled at uh, marketing his own material. Here on the left, I'm showing you just a, one of the flyers for his little shop. And as spectacular as this necklace is, I also want to point out the box that it's in. So he and his wife uh, worked on designing these presentation boxes for his jewelry, too. That was, again, very a key part of presenting his work. And again, he, hard to see here, but it has his name. Um, in the box. And so again, just to finish, having jumped from the early part of his career, he spent um, sort of the last decade or two of his career on the road. He was exhibiting all over the country, lecturing wild, widely, as you can see from this extensive list of, of venues that he lectured at. Um, he, throughout his career, and even during a time sort of this accelerating um, pace of life, Hale continued to be an extraordinarily vocal proponent of arts and crafts ideals. When he was in Boston, he was deeply engaged in the leadership of the Society of Arts and Crafts, serving on their jury, their library committee, and he ultimately became the dean of the Jewelers Guild, which was essentially a professional working group to advocate for the needs of jewelers um, within the Society of Arts and Crafts and beyond. And my presentation today has just skimmed on the surface of how Frank Gardner Hale, a young graphic designer from Connecticut with talent, determination, and passionate belief in the ideals of the arts and craft movement, helped pave the way for numerous artisans who followed and whose legacy can still be traced in training programs and artists' activity in Boston to this very day. Hopefully it's given you some insight into how, into one of the key individuals who helped Boston develop its distinctive look in jewelry that my colleague Emily will now address in greater detail. Good morning. So I'm going to share with you the evolution of this Boston look, which as we came to know it and came to talk about it. As Noni and Megan have both pointed out, Hale was not the only artist jeweler working in Boston. Along with the city's blossoming education programs, the establishment of the Society of Arts and Crafts created a unity among craftspeople and provided power in numbers with shared opportunities for marketing and retail sales. This spirit of cooperation was emphasized in the organization's principles of handicraft, which emphasized artistic cooperation. There's many examples of this that we could share with you, but the strongest exist in the work of three jewelers, Frank Gardner Hale, Josephine Hartwell Shaw, and Edward Everett Oakes. Their works shown here left to right, and I'm gonna look at these more closely with you in a moment. In 1909, two years after Frank Gardner Hale arrived or returned back to Boston, he hired Edward Everett Oakes as an apprentice to work as his assistant. The burgeoning metalsmith spent the next five years learning from Hale and making hand-wrought jewelry under the Hale name. Oakes worked for Hale until 1914 when he joined the bench at Josephine Hartwell Shaw's new Duxbury workshop. After the death of her husband, she had relocated from Boston to Duxbury, where she spent half the year making jewelry and the other half the year running a tea room. Megan's research into Hale revealed that it's quite likely that during Oakes's time with Shaw, he only worked in Duxbury for half the year, returning to Hale's workshop during the summer months. And you can see them here in the workshop together. Now I'm gonna skip over the part about Hale since Megan really covered that in detail. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about Josephine Hartwell Shaw. After a successful career as an art educator, she began working as a metalsmith in 1905. As part of her design education, she studied with both Denman Ross at Harvard and with Arthur uh, Wellesley Dow at Pratt. Her interest in an Eastern aesthetic is evidenced here in this substantial necklace with two large jade elements in the centerpiece and also a jade clasp. Uh, these were likely taken, these elements here, and also with the clasp, from a Chinese artifact that she took apart here and put back together as this necklace. The green elements are not chrysoberyl or jade, as you might think. They're actually green glass. 
In a 1915 article in House Beautiful, Shaw described how in making jewelry, the stone suggests the setting, she said. Oakes echoed this idea years later when he reflected that, quote, in jewelry, it may be that the stone or stone suggests the design, and then again, it may be that the design calls for certain gems. A limited number of Shaw's work has been uncovered, so it's hard to define her style, but it's very clear that she loved gemstones and color, sometimes opting for unusual gemstones, as we see here in this necklace, where she's using carved tourmaline and carved pink quartz. In 1914, Shaw donated this cross to the Museum of Fine Arts in memory of her husband, and here again, the gemstones seem to have been the starting point for the design, with the metalwork intended to highlight the cluster of pink gems. At the MFA, it joined two other examples of Shaw's work, a brooch and a ring that you see here on the left, which had been acquired the previous year, making Shaw the first female jeweler represented in the institution's encyclopedic collection. In 1917, after time spent working with both Hale and Shaw, Oakes was elevated to master status at the Society of Arts and Crafts. And the following year, he opened his own workshop and hired his own assistant, really bringing forward the next wave of Boston Arts and Crafts jewelers. Edward Everett Oakes cleverly used his name as inspiration. His pieces feature leaves, especially oak leaves, and other natural forms and combine metalwork and gems in a way that I feel builds upon the examples of his teachers. Whereas Hale and Shaw usually made the stone the centerpiece, Oakes carefully considered the relationship between the gemstone selection and the metalwork and created designs where one can't exist without the other. In this example, Oakes is clearly influenced by his teachers, but he takes these designs to a new level in the way that the pearls and the diamonds are sprinkled into the gold. After striking out on his own, Oakes remained in the good graces of both of his mentors. In 1928, following a dinner party, Hale wrote Oakes saying, your loyalty to me has always pleased and gratified me, and I am always proud of your beautiful jewelry which develops and grows every year. Two years later, in 1930, when Shaw retired, she directed all of her commission to Oakes Studios. Oakes jewelry bears comparison to the works of Lewis Comfort Tiffany, and indeed, he was awarded the Tiffany Foundation Fellowship that allowed him to spend time at Laurelton Hall, the artist's splendid estate on Long Island. Many brooches and necklaces by Tiffany Studios frame exceptional specimens with garland surrounds that highlighted both sides of the gemstone. And like Tiffany, Oakes believed that the back of the jewel must be as beautifully crafted as the front, and some of his necklaces, like this cross, were designed to be reversible. Looking at the work of Hale, Shaw, and Oakes, certain similarities begin to develop, and in our conversations, Noni, Megan, and I started calling it the Boston look, and the name stuck. This likely, this was likely sharpened, perhaps at first unknowingly, by the Society of Arts and Crafts jurors that Noni mentioned, who were tasked with selecting work for the Society's retail showroom and exhibitions. To give you a better sense of the look, let's go back to the early years before Oaks and consider the city's other jewelers. The Society's 10th anniversary exhibition in 1907 included the work of more than 40 jewelers. This included Josephine Shaw, Elizabeth Copeland, and Margaret Rogers, who we've seen examples by already. And in this exhibition, each object was given a letter classification. So work labeled A was designed and made by a single craftsman. B work was made in collaboration, where it was designed by one person and made by another. And C meant that two designers or craftsmen participated in the design and execution of an object whereas D meant that works were designed and executed and fabricated by an anonymous factory system. Almost like a grading system, right? You don't want to be a D. And notably, each of the designs by Copeland, Rogers, and Shaw met the A standard. Local schools and technical programs, along with a vibrant apprenticeship system, aided in training a generation of jewelers in Boston. 
Society of Arts and Crafts records, newspaper advertisements, and magazine articles attest that like their predecessors, these artists were prolific in their production and were celebrated in their lifetimes. However, relatively few examples of work by these jewelers exist today. So you have to keep in mind how little material has surfaced even with our research. Early on, we started a spreadsheet listing all of the jewelers and metal workers that we found working in Boston from the founding of the Society of Arts and Crafts through 1930, and we came up with 168 names. But only 10 are included in the book and 14 in the exhibition. So there's still a lot out there that's left to learn for sure. Here we're looking at Margaret Rogers. She studied design and color at Massachusetts Normal Arts School, now MassArt, as Noni said. And sometimes her, met her metalwork seems to disappear behind an array of colorful gemstones. As in the last slide, this example on the right, you can barely see the gold that's there. Rather, your focus is really drawn to the, the opal and the surrounding gems. In the exhibition in the book, we included designs that we would call typical, um, such as the brooch that I showed you in the last slide and this necklace, as well as more um, uh, less expected designs. And so here, I call this typical because it come, these types of necklaces come up again and again where you have these cabochon stones uh, alternating with pearls and surrounded by decorative metalwork and a floral motif. And at first glance, her work is quite similar to that of Hale and Shaw, but there are subtle differences. Her colors have a greater variety, and her design formula is much more consistent. Now, another one of these early jewelers is Elizabeth Copeland. And, and in 1907, she displayed six ornaments at the Society's exhibition. Clients who were familiar with her work as an enamelist may have been surprised to find that none of these examples of jewelry included enamel. While this brooch wasn't one of the pieces that she showed in that exhibition, it was made around the same time and is a rare example of her work as a jeweler. Here we have a design around a, uh, an oval turquoise gemstone with a gold frame and leaves that terminate in a, radiating, uh, in a radiant opal drop. Of course, from these slides, it's impossible to get a sense of scale, but it's relatively small and it's possible it was worn like this. As you'll hear in the next half of my talk, I was really interested in learning how this jewelry was worn and what it was worn with. So I took a close look at the portraits done by the city's painters, and I was particularly struck by the work of William McGregor Paxton, whose work stood out as an excellent source of information about fashion. He taught at the museum school and was no doubt familiar with the city's metal workers. Although most of the jewelry in Paxton's paintings is traditional rather than artistic, such as ropes of pearls, in this portrait of his mother, she's painted wearing a turquoise colored brooch that very closely resembles this one by Copeland. And you can even tell that it's turquoise because he's, he's left the inclusion here on the left that's very similar to the Copeland piece on the right. And it seems that Paxton may have used the same brooch again, this time with a matching ring as worn by his wife in the crystal. And you can see her wearing it here on the sleeve of the dress in a matching ring as she's holding this crystal ball. This also has a striking similarity to an, a brooch by Lucretia Bush. Made in 18 karat gold, it shows her refinement as a goldsmith, but as yet we have no information about where she trained. As a child, Lucretia uh, McMurdy spent a few years living in Paris, and in 1900, she married and settled in Chestnut Hill. In 1911, a few years after her mother's death, she sold her share of her family home on Marlboro Street to her sister and joined the Society of Arts and Crafts as a jeweler. She was so skilled that after just five years, she was elevated to the rank of master, and known examples of her work are extremely rare. We located just two in the course of this project. A second example came when a colleague at the Society of Arts and Crafts, Crafts asked if we, were similar with the, if we were familiar with the mark LB. You'll see, if you've looked at the book, you've seen that in the back we've included all of the maker's marks because we feel that this is import, an important way to help to identify these pieces because we know there's so many more pieces out there. The year that Bush became a master craftsman, Gertrude Twitchell joined the Society of Arts and Crafts. Twitchell had studied with Martin, and like Copeland, she, she worked primarily as an enamelist. 
Few examples of her jewelry survive, and among them is this large-scale brooch with a naturalistic um, shape of seven stylized peacock feathers with citrine eyes combined with purple, blue, and green enamel. And it really conveys this design harmony for which Twitchell and the Boston jewelers were known. Yet its scale and combination of gems and fluidity set it apart from other brooches of this period. It was suggested to us that it may have started its life as a hair comb. And while I can't say for sure, the scale certainly makes it possible. There's a brooch by Ashby in the MFA's collection that similarly started out as a comb, but as the trend for hair combs went out of fashion, it was converted into a brooch. And here you can see it uh, as we have it in the museum today and as it started out. In 1916, Jesse Ames Dunbar was considered a leading art jeweler alongside Shaw, Hale, and Rogers. And one author mentioned her, her work as having a special importance. But as we began working on this exhibition and book, none of us had heard of her. Megan was on the case. She quickly dug into Ancestry.com. And before the day was over, she had located relatives. And we were fortunate that the family had kept some wonderful examples of Aunt Jessie's work because she's the only jeweler featured in the exhibition who didn't sign her work, and we wouldn't have otherwise been able to identify it. Perhaps not surprisingly, as you've heard from Noni and Megan, some metal workers and jewelers who trained in the city settled in suburban or vacation areas or summered in different areas. And so we see Shaw retiring to Duxbury, Oak summering in the White Mountains, Hale in Marblehead, um, and other artists were also scattered around New England. And these studios introduced vacationers to jewelry being made in Boston. Jessie Ames Dunbar divided her time between Boston and Monhegan Island, a rocky artist community 10 miles off the coast of Maine. And after 1916, she actually worked in Boston um, in the same studio as Margaret Rogers at 26 Lime Street. In Maine, she sold her work in an eponymous studio retail space. And like Rogers, her work is colorful and using a wide variety of gemstones. Hazel Blake French studied at the museum school. And in 1914, after graduation, she married and set up a studio, a year-round studio in Sandwich. The location on Cape Cod attracted beach-going vacationers. And French worked in silver and glass, not gemstones. The Boston and Sandwich Glass Company had closed in 1888, two years after or before French was born. But since her childhood, this, the area around the, fact, the former factory had fascinated her. And she would comb the area looking for bits of rubble that she then sent to New York lapidaries for cutting and polishing. And she used them like gemstones in her jewelry. Among her peers, she was the only one who consistently worked in alternative materials. And she was the first member of the Society of Arts and Crafts to exhibit faux gemstones. Over time, a recognizable style of jewelry making emerged. It was noted for uniting design and hand craftsmanship, as well as its use of color and precious material. This set Boston apart from other arts and crafts centers like Chicago. In writing the book and curating the exhibition, we were able to utilize the museum's scientific resources to confirm the materials used in each example that's on view and published in the book. And it really demonstrated for us Boston Jewelers' wide variety of materials that they were incorporating from glass to watermelon tourmalines to diamonds. The jewelers have such a consistent look, though, that it can be difficult to recognize which of the city's designer craftspeople created them. And so for the connoisseurs in the audience, I have a few subtle ways of telling who's who. Almost all of the jewelers, or all of the jewelers, I should say, are using bezel settings, which means that the, the metal is fully surrounding the gemstone. And this is done to create a greater saturation of color. This sets them apart for some of their British counterparts, which are using prong settings. The Boston jewelers aren't, aren't doing that. This brooch on the bottom left is an example by Margaret Rogers. And sometimes, I think oftentimes, Margaret Rogers, in her settings, makes a flower. And so if you look around the gemstone, you can see that she's cut away the metal or created a surround that makes each of these gems the center part of a flower. I think if you look at examples by Hale, which is here on the left, or Oaks, who is here in the middle, you see a difference in the way that they're treating their leaves and flowers. 
For example, Oaks's leaves are very flat. You can see here in these cufflinks, he has these elongated leaves that are quite flat, whereas Oaks is creating much more rounded sculptural examples. Another tip that we were given in dating Oaks's work, which is incredibly tricky to date because he's working in the same style until 1960, is the shape of the wire that he's using. And I know this is super nitpicky, but if you look here at the wire that's creating these, these, these kind of curly cues, Early on, he's using rounded wire, and then after 1940, the wire is, is square. And so if you look close, it's one way of dating his work. Really, the style evolved outside of the city, but in Boston, the look remained consistent into the middle of the 20th century as Oakes worked in this style, as I said, until his death in 1960. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly, now that we have an idea of what the Boston look looked like, think about who wore it and how it was worn. Descriptions of jewels as they were worn are rare. One of the few comments comes from Elizabeth Stone, the wife of the metalsmith Arthur Stone. She imaginatively declared, the jewelry carried with it visions of wearers never less than six foot two, moving with theatrical impermeability to the fixed gaze of their fellow creatures. <laughs> and certainly a necklace like this kind of makes you think of that vision. This necklace is incredibly long. For example, the butterfly would have probably fallen in the lap of the wearer when she was seated. But it wasn't without precedent. Here's an example from Vogue in 1920 of a woman wearing a very kind of similar necklace. The wearer of this jewelry was most likely a patron of the arts who wore her handcrafted, locally made ornaments with fashionable clothing. And enthusiasts in Boston would have encountered artist-made jewelry at exhibitions at the Society of Arts and Crafts, but these jewelers also gained a national following after they participated in exhibitions like the Louisiana Purchase Exhibition in 1904, and newspapers and popular magazines regularly reported on Hale and his contemporaries. Here you see Hale in 1932 you know, in one of his lectures showing the jewelry to this group of very fashionably dressed women. In Boston, you could buy jewelry at the Society of Arts and Crafts showroom. The society was committed to providing patrons with the opportunity to buy work by its members. And in the 1920s, the Society of Arts and Crafts even opened a second showroom in New York. Here you can see a map on the left showing where to find it um, on, the, on the east side location near Central Park. This was published in the New Yorker. Considering the jewelry alongside contemporary magazines, a picture begins to emerge of the clothing that accompanied the jewelry. This necklace was illustrated in Good Housekeeping in 1911, and it was described as having a seaweed motif. As Noni explained, it was considered an example of the new jewelry art. You can see it here in the top left. The author observed, quote, the changes in costume are studied by the designers of jewelry and have more or less influence on their work. She instructed women to, wear, to think about wearing a ring or earrings in the morning and a watch or a simple bracelet during the day. Accessories like belt buckles, bar brooches, circle pins also complemented daytime dresses. William Paxton's painting, The New Necklace, which is also featured in the exhibition, offers a glimpse inside the home of a Boston woman around 1910. The intimate scene was likely staged, but the sumptuous clothing is likely quite similar to what would have been worn by a consumer of Boston Arts and Crafts jewelry. Hale, in some of the writings that are included in the archives, had said that the colorful cabochon cut gemstones, which were unlikely to be worn in the evening, were, quote, very appropriate for day use. As we were going through, I, I was looking to seek out some of the consumers of arts and crafts and who wore it, who bought it, and I found two names um, rose to the surface. I hope to find more over the course of the exhibition. One was the stage actress Julia Marlowe, who was an avid supporter of the, of the city's metalsmiths. She owned this goblet from the exhibition, as well as a tea set in Parager by Arthur Stone. And in 1916, the International Studio Magazine reported that she had also commissioned some of Josephine Shaw's most exemplary work. Another client was Mrs. Eben D. Jordan. She was um, married to um, the son of the founder of Jordan Marsh Department Store. And she lived in Brookline before moving to the family's home at 46 Beacon Street, just a stone's throw to number nine park. 
uh, around 1897. And she was an art collector, a patron of the arts, and it would have been natural for her to have been interested in artist-made jewelry like this incredible collar by Shaw that she owned um, that was actually displayed here at the MFA in 1911. We have no idea where it is today, but if any of you know, I'd, I'd love to know. <laughs> Women in Boston had a choice of retailers at all level. The city was, had scattered shops for jewelry all over, all over, especially around the common where we're looking here. And even at Jordan Marsh department store, they sold fashion-focused jewelry, this up-and-coming costume jewelry um, that was available on its first floor showrooms. This was really stood in great contrast to the types of jewelry that uh, the artists made jewelry that was at the Society of Arts and Crafts where they were offering one of a kind pieces. But the notion of costume jewelry, which may seem at odds with the jewelry that we've been showing you, is mentioned here. In April 1922, a gallery on Fifth Avenue in New York announced that it was selling earrings and costume jewelry by Frank Gardner Hale. By 1920, Clothing had become more streamlined and hemlines had inched shorter and a different style of jewelry was really re required to go along with this. And earrings were one type of ornament that producers and consumers both struggled to accept. Hale complained that, quote, earrings were the only ornament retained by civilized nations which necessitate a mutation of the body before they can be worn. <laughs> but eventually he admits he too fell victim to the craze. And here you can see an example on the right and he tried to encourage his contemporaries to follow the whims of fashion. One of the most fashion-forward designs to come out of Boston during the 20s was a gold tassel by Oaks. Such necklaces were both fashionable and popular. Before long, they were available at every level of the market, from inexpensive department store versions to gold and diamond examples by French jewelers like Cartier. Oaks's tassel paired perfectly with the stark ensembles of the day, and like you know, his other long tassels, it was meant to swing and move with the body, and you can imagine the dances like the Charleston being danced while wearing a necklace like this and how it would have swung about. Hoke, Hale explains that these jewelers, Boston jewelers, made a very good place for themselves, and then came the market crash. With rare exception, the look that had been pioneered in Boston during the early 20th century continued into the 1920s, as the community of jewelers largely resisted change. The shift was, was witnessed directly by the city's artist, and Oaks in particular, who had planned to exhibit this masterwork at Number 9 Park in mid-October of 1929. Oakes had spent years on this jewel box, his masterwork. He scoured the world looking for the right color amethyst. He, cut, he had them cut to his exacting specifications. He looked for matched pearls. He placed gems in the handles of the jewel box so the owner was forced to touch them. And he even set onyx into the hand-carved wooden base for the jeweled feet to rest on. Every detail was methodically considered. Leading up to the exhibition, the city's newspapers proclaimed it a masterpiece worthy of the Museum of Fine Arts. Unfortunately, Oakes's hopes were dashed, as Hale explained, with the stock market crash resulting and the depression ending the heyday for Boston artists. It entered the museum's collection 70 years later, long after Oakes's death. You'll notice that we've hesitated to date the works as the artists spent decades working in the same style and instead we've worked to gather the most important examples, early examples, things that we feel confident were made before the stock market crash. Today, while the styles have no doubt changed and diversified, Boston remains an important metalsmithing center, thanks in large part to the city's educational institutions. Robust metals programs continue in Boston at Mass Art, the Museum School, North Bennett Street School, and outside the city at UMass Dartmouth and RISD. The Society of Arts and Crafts, now in the seaport, continues to flourish. This exhibition examines a very narrow moment in history, but we hope that you'll leave this lecture and this exhibition thinking about the many connections between the philosophy of arts and crafts movement and the various artisanal movements of today. Thank you.